Welcome. So good to see you all here today to celebrate, to sing together, and to praise God for what he has done on the cross in conquering sin and death. A little girl and her father were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring afternoon. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a honeybee flew into the window of the car. And since the girl was deathly allergic to bee stings, she became petrified. Boys and girls, how many of you have been stung by a bumblebee? It hurts every single time. Her father quickly reaches out and with his bare hand grabs the bee out of midair. Fathers, how many of you have done that? <laughs> it's okay. You can lie. Raise your hand. <laughs> You're the man. He held it for a second and then after a few moments, he releases it. As soon as he let it go, the daughter became frantic again as it buzzed around her. And once again, he reached out his hand, but this time, as he opened his hand, he pointed to his palm. There, stuck in the skin, was a stinger, the stinger of the bee. He said, you see, you don't have to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. As followers of Jesus Christ, we do not have to fear or be afraid of the sting of death. This is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? We celebrate today the death of death and the life of life because Jesus died and rose again, taking away the sting of death. It is gone. We don't have to fear anymore as believers and followers of Jesus. Woody Allen, who you may know, is the poster boy in Hollywood for rejecting religion and moral principles altogether. He is scared to death of death. He talks about it all the time. He makes jokes all the time, trying to relieve his fear of dying. He said once, I don't want to achieve mortality through my work in Hollywood. I want to re achieve mortality through not dying. They say Christmas is the promise and Easter is the proof. There is a difference between evidence and proof. The evidence of the resurrection of Jesus is overwhelming. It is the most documented event. You've heard me say this before in human history. And on Friday in the Holy Week Devo, if you received that, I gave a little bit of information statistically, the difference between the, the historical writers in the first century on the death and resurrection of Jesus compared to any other author or poet the evidence demands belief. The proof, though, which is different than the evidence, the proof is in lives changed by the gospel. You can ignore the evidence. If you so choose, I would not recommend it. But you cannot... Ignore, especially for those of you who truly and genuinely believe. You personally can't ignore the evidence, the proof of your own life being transformed. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 6. We believe here in Sudden River is, that, that the Scripture has authority. We, we go to Scripture for truth. We don't go to our life experiences for truth. We don't go to other people's experiences. We allow the word of God to dictate and inform our experiences. 
And so we will be looking today at Romans chapter 6, 1 through 11. If you don't have a Bible, I would encourage you to reach forward and grab the one in front of you. I want you to see the holy word of God with your own eyes. Just don't take my word for it. As we walk verse by verse through these 11 verses, point by point, it's found on page uh, 886 in the black Bible in front of you. And this will probably be, it's my first time being in an Easter service that is not preached or focused on one of the eyewitness accounts from the Gospels. Paul wrote the book of Romans. It is a theologically rich and deep book. I was thrilled to hear that my son Zach and his mentor Lauren are memorizing the book of Romans. We're going to hold them to that. All 16 chapters. Paul is an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. When he saw Christ, when his eyes were open and he saw Christ raised from the dead, it transformed Paul's life. All the people around Paul, they didn't want to believe the evidence of the resurrection right in front of them, but they could not deny the proof that Paul murdered and hated Christians, was a sinner who justified his sin by his love for God, his false love for God, and then was transformed into a preacher of the gospel because the gospel saved him. And so as you turn to Romans, I want to, by way of introduction, draw your attention real quickly to Luke chapter 15. You do not have to turn there. I just want to set the stage for jumping into Romans chapter 6. In Luke 15, Jesus tells three imperative stories. One is about a man who had a hundred sheep and lost one. Another was about a lady who had a valuable coin and, another, and, and lost that coin. And then the other story is about a father who lost his son. We know this as the prodigal. Each one of these stories is a story about salvation, being rescued and saved, returning and redeemed, forgiveness. In each picture, as it... Each story tells a picture about a lost soul, again, coming back to God. And they all three share a common reaction. At the end of the story of the lost sheep, it says, and when he comes home and he calls together his friends and his neighbors and says to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep, which I have found my sheep, which was lost. And the Lord says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who never need to repent. At the end of the story of the lost coin, coin, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says these words, rejoice with me. For I have found the coin which I lost. I would love, I don't have time to go into the historical background to the significance of that coin. She couldn't get married without it. This is a big deal. She found it. And then says, in the same way, I tell you, this is Jesus' words, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The story of the lost son ends in the same way. The son is found, and the father says these words, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to be merry and celebrate. In each story, there is a response of incredible joy. The thing I want you to have in your mind is that salvation and celebration, they go together hand in hand. Salvation and joy, they belong together This is what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday. Being made right with God, this causes 
God to experience joy. Christ is a part of this joy. Angels are a part of this joy. The church is a part of this joy. And the one who is saved. You see, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that brings joy. God rescuing sinners from hell. That is the gospel. There are a lot of false gospels all over the world. Gospels that say you can earn your salvation or you have to join a specific religious group to be saved or you have to do specific things. No, Christ did it on the cross. This is the one true gospel that God rescues man from hell for his glory. I want you to know, as we look at these passages today, it doesn't matter how you die. And we're all going to die. We're all going to pay an account. It doesn't matter if it's old age or you run your car into a pole. Ecclesiastes 8.8 makes this clear. No man has authority to restrain the wind. So also no man has authority over the day of his death. We can't fully understand this. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility before God, but our responsibility, as you've heard me preach a lot, doesn't eliminate or dictate God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty doesn't eliminate, eliminate our responsibility. The moment scripture teaches that you are saved, you are set free Free from punishment from past sins. Free from punishment from current sins. Free from the punishment of future sins you haven't committed. You are free from the once unbreakable pattern of sin. Sin's stronghold on your life. You have been set free to live in a way that pleases God that you couldn't do before, but it brings peace and joy. The main point that I want you to walk away from this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ is this, that the death and resurrection of Jesus brings the life of life, what Paul calls a life that lives to God. And in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, there are five reminders Paul is going to give us that I want us to stir in this, this intense joy to stir in our hearts as we look at God's word. Five reminders of a life lived to God. Number one, a life lived to God is a life dead to sin. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Do we are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Believer's position, because of his faith and belief in Christ, shows that a true believer cannot, listen, continue in sin. The word continue is important here. Circle it in your Bible. If you're using the Pew Bible, circle it. So that somebody else will go, wow, that's an important word. I should know what that means. The word continue means to habitually yield to sin. Continue, the Greek word epomeno. Epomeno is this word, two, two parts put together. Epa means in. Meno means to abide or endure. You may remember the word meno in the John 15 study that we did. When epi is put... Ep Epimeno, when that is put at the beginning of the word, it intensifies the meaning in the Greek language. So this word, meno, is strengthened. There's a force behind it of devotion and persistence. Are we to be persistent and, con and, and devoted to sin so that we can receive more grace? A true believer no longer makes a practice of sin. This is what Paul is saying. He, he's not saying, and I'm going to talk about this greatly this morning, he's not saying that you will no longer sin. 
He's talking about continuing in that sin. When a man turns to God, he turns away from sin. This is repentance. It is a contradiction to say that when a man turns to God, he turns to more and more sin. This is the heartbeat of discipleship. Helping people understand their sin helping people understand who Christ is and what he has done, and learning to surrender their life, die to their sin, take up their cross daily and follow. This is the heartbeat of biblical counseling and the counseling that we do for free for people who are struggling here at Sun River Church and in our community. It starts with identifying and understanding what sin is. Puritan writer John Owens, in talking about sin and grace, he says this about a pastor. A pastor only has two problems in his life. Persuading unbelievers that they are under the dominion of sin, and then persuading believers that they're not under the dominion of sin. This is like parenting. Pastoring and parenting, they're the same. You may be sitting there going, well, I'm not a pastor, but if you're a parent, you're a pastor. And there's times when you got to look at your son and go, oh, are you kidding me right now? Like Heidi and I said to Zach Thursday, you got to be kidding me. You're not going to be in church on Easter? And, you know, Zach sends it. He's like, well, do you want me to stay home? Well, yeah, if you're going to go to heaven, you got to be in church on Sunday. <laughs> He's in a golf tournament with uh, Sac State up in Seattle. But is, uh, told me that in his practice round today, he would be live streaming. So I'm giving him a shout out if he's live streaming while he's doing his practice round. We got to understand what sin really is. And not going to church on Sunday is close, but not quite a sin. <laughs> There's a level of it where it's a heart issue. And the scriptures say, don't forsake the assembly but it's really about fellowship and community and koinonia, not just checking the attendance box. And then when that attendance box gets unchecked because you just, you know, it just, the church didn't measure up. The pastor's just too bald. There's just too much stuff going on. I, I'm going to go to a, a church where, where the pastor has a full head of hair. He's smarter. <laughs> but we got to be clear about what sin is. Prior to salvation, Paul's, Paul's giving us some direction here. He's talking about the term he uses here in this verse refers to the, the sin that has controlling power. Prior to salvation, sin, prior to believing the genuine, genuinely saved believer, prior to that moment, sin held sway over our moral and ethical decision. Paul's point here is that believers have died in relation to the power of sin over them. And the reason why they died, you're going to see in just a second, is because Jesus Christ and their identity with Christ has changed them. This is a transformation of the Holy Spirit. This is what the Bible calls regeneration. You are born new, born again. Don't confuse the sin we struggle with in sanctification which, with what is talked about here. We're going to struggle daily in our sanctification, moment by moment, fight by fight, battle by battle with sin. But the Holy Spirit is going to allow us to be convicted by that sin. Don't ever take bad advice from somebody who tries to marginalize, minimize, or redefine what the Bible says is sin. This will cost you your soul, and they will pay an account before God. I will pay an account before God if I try to give what my desire or my definition or what I like in regards to what the Bible says is sin. I'm paying, this is why scriptures is the authority what the Bible says. And in the Bible, my rule of thumb in hermeneutics and biblical interpretation is the, the plain things in Bible, those are the main things. And the main things in the Bible, those are plain. There's a lot of things we're not going to understand. But there are very simple, basic things that are recorded in Scripture. Sin, as it's listed all throughout Scripture, 
you don't need a Greek lexicon to get a full understanding of it. Are we, Paul says, to continue in sin that grace may abound all the more? Charles Spurgeon says this. These are strong words. He was the prince of preachers. An unchanged life is the mark of an unchanged heart. And an unchanged heart is the sign of an unregenerate, unchanged life. The whole spirit of the gospel is opposed to the idea of sinning because God, listen, is gracious. He is a gracious God. His grace is a gift. Should we sin so that we get more of this gift? No. The basic definition of grace is the Greek word charis. It simply means unearned favor or undeserved, an undeserved gift. The theological definition I would put in these words, grace is that which God does for mankind through his son, life, death, and resurrection on the cross, which mankind cannot earn, mankind does not deserve, and mankind can never accomplish. Grace is all that God freely does on the basis of his good and perfect will. And his good and perfect will is recorded in his scriptures. Paul says, Meganomai, may it never be, by no means. Paul destroys the notion that more sin brings more grace. And then, classic Paul exhortation, he uses two rhetorical questions to us and to his readers in the first century that contain heavy, deep, rich Christian truth. The first question, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? This question highlights the fact that believers no longer serve their old master. We've been enslaved to sin because of our old nature, and we found our old nature to be irresistible. Yeah, the common laws of man and of our culture will, will keep us from being totally crazy, but ultimately our hearts serve our old master. But death, the death of Christ frees us from that bondage. Could you imagine how tragic it would be if an emancipated slave continued to suffer the pain and mistreatment when he or she could just run free, they're set free, but they're still enslaved? You couldn't imagine that. This is what Paul's saying. Shall we who have died to sin still live in it? And then the next question, do you not know? You can underline that in your Bibles. Paul says this statement, do you not know? Ask this question about 14 times in the book of Romans. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, have been baptized into his death? This phrase, do you not know, is, it means to perceive in one's consciousness. It has nothing to do with emotion. It has nothing to do with how you feel. This phrase in the Greek doesn't have any of the same forms of somebody saying, shame on you. No, this, this word, this, this sentence literally means uneducated and ignorant. Are you uneducated and ignorant? All who have placed their faith in Jesus, he's saying, have been baptized unto Jesus. Now, the context of this is really important. The context makes it clear this is not talking about water baptism. This is a strong word picture that would have been very familiar to the Roman Christians, Roman believers, especially the Jews. The word baptized 
is from the Greek word baptizo, which means to immerse or submerge, to be baptized into something, symbolically is what we're talking about here, to be baptized into something is to com be completely cloaked by it. And when I did the word study on this, that word cloaked, covered, metal cloaked. Sorry, <laughs> it's the only thing I could think of. Some of you know what metal cloak is. It's not in the Bible, but the word cloaked is. This is all throughout Scripture. It's talking about the virtue of our identification, the believer's identification with Christ, our identification with Christ in his death and his resurrection. Then we have been emancipated. We have been set free from sin. Identity with Christ that Paul talks about here begins with belief, but it's really clear that this belief that identifies with the death identifies us with the death and resurrection of Christ has an ongoing effect it's not a one and done type identification you see the death and resurrection of Jesus this immersion in the identity of Christ's death and resurrection as a christian even though the word christian has been completely redefined in our culture today in the truest sense, this belief transforms a person's life. If there is no change in attitude or outlook, desires, priorities, preference, actions, this should be alarming. Salvation is not just fire insurance. Too many people believe that, well, I'm good. I prayed, I repented, I came down the aisle, I did this, I did that, now I'm good. And I can live the way I want, I can believe the way I want. Some even take their desires and their wills, they never surrendered to Scripture, and they redefine what Scripture is to fit their preference. And they think they're good. This is why Jesus gives this alarming warning in Matthew 7. Many, many will stand before me in that day. And they'll say, look at all the things I did in your name. And he says, depart from me, doer of iniquity, I didn't know you. Kent Hughes, in his commentary, writes that the argument that we should continue in sin because we are under grace is absolutely phallus or fallacious. The reverse is true. It is impossible to continue living unchanged when you become a true follower of Jesus. And I want to stress, Paul is not teaching that sin in regards to the nature, our sin nature that we are born with. He is not saying that is destroyed or becomes non-existent in a Christian's life. He is not teaching that a Christian can become sinless on this side of eternity or glory. No, we will wrestle with our flesh until we are redeemed and in glory with God. A Christian may sin, but sinning is not what Paul is saying here. His habitual, ongoing, repeated practice to live a life to God, something transforms. Because a life Live to God is, as Paul would say, a life that walks in a new way. Verse 4, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might, this is a power statement in this text, in these scriptures, and I would encourage you to underline it. It's an easy one to memorize. We too might walk in newness of life. A new way of living. Verse 4 and verse 3 in regards to baptism is not, again, talking about water. This is a spiritual emphasis. I want to make this clear because some claim that grace and salvation are received through water and not through faith alone. 
Warren Wearsby, in his commentary, gives a warning to us. When we read about baptism in the New Testament, we must exercise discernment and grounded hermeneutics to determine, hermeneutics is the word for interpretation, to determine whether the word is to be interpreted literally as a water baptism or symbolically as a spiritual baptism. Kent Hughes adds, the overall emphasis of these verses is upon our profound identity in Christ. Baptism bears with it the idea of identification. This is the specific emphasis. He goes on to say, we are so profoundly identified with the death and resurrection of Jesus, that we die with him symbolically and truly are raised with him symbolically so that now we share in a new life together. We, too, walk, might walk in newness of life. This refers to our manner of living our new habitual way, we would use the term lifestyle. And people look at us as the bride of Christ, the church. We are light in a dark world. People see joy in the midst of struggle and strife and suffering. They look at us and they see a life that is living in fellowship and community that is authentic and real and they want it. D.L. Moody alluded to the believer's walk when he said, every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. J. Vernon McGee, I love his commentary on these verses. Walking is not a balloon ascension. J. Vernon McGee has a wonderful talent for giving you a visual to what the Bible says. If you imagine a balloon ascending, he's saying that's not it. A great many people think that the Christian life is some great, overwhelming experience. I've been trying to get Heidi to do hot air ballooning. She won't do it. (laughs) Convince her that it's an overwhelming experience. (laughs) Vernon McGee says that's not the Christian life. It's not like a rocket going into outer space. It's where you live the Christian life. It's not where you live the Christian life. Rather, it's how. How you live at home. How you live in the office. The schoolroom. The street. Again, this, this word newness here refers to a renewal. A new quality. A new character. You begin to reflect Christ-like character. I love talking about and thinking about Christ-like character at church. I don't like thinking about it when I'm driving down the road in my red Jeep or playing basketball. A life lived to God is new. A life lived to God, verses 5, he begins to unpack, is a life connected to the resurrection. For we have been united with him in his death, been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Sumphustos is the Greek word. This word means born together. We certainly have been united, born together with him in his death and in his resurrection. But in order to understand what Paul is saying, I've got to give you a little illustration. I've got to set this up because I want you to understand there are two words in the Greek for the word with. One of those words is the word meta, and the other is soon. Let me illustrate it this way. Sydney, in the last year, has decided that 
she loves baking bread. And she has what's called a starter. I'm still trying to understand the, the starter, but she's learned this from Karen Brown, and so she's baking bread all the time. Imagine she takes all the ingredients out and she puts them on a piece of wax paper or a cookie sheet. All the ingredients, they're separate, so you get the flour, you get the salt, the, the blob of starter, whatever that is, and all these other, and they're there. They're, they're with each other. This is the word meta. They're with. Now imagine she does what you do, and she takes them and mixes them all up, and they, they, they get all mixed together, and then they, they go in the oven, and you bake them. This is the word soon. Once they are baked, you cannot separate them. They're mixed together. They cannot be separated. So let me read this again, and you understand the visual of what Paul's saying. He's not using meta. He's using soon in the word with Christ. For if we've been united with him in his death, a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. You mean to tell me, Andy, that I've been united with him in his death and now I'm united in his resurrection? We are united and mixed together and can't be separated for those who believe, who those who genuinely have trusted Christ and the Spirit has regenerated them? Yes, that's what's being said. Okay, Andy, then why do I still struggle with sin? Paul knows that you and I will still struggle with sin. Do you know Paul is still struggling with sin? Sin is going to often always be, is going to often always be, is constantly going to be lurking and trying to pull us away from what the Spirit is trying to do in us. What Paul is saying is I'm no longer bound by it. I still have a responsibility to choose not to sin, to abide in Christ. And when I fall, it doesn't pull me away from being united with him. It breaks that fellowship. So I've, so I've got to, to confess, but I don't lose my salvation. I've got to confess my sin. And, and genuine confession and repentance is evidence a, that I'm a sinner, and that God is transforming and changing me. Because before Christ, when I sinned, I felt sorry because of the consequence of sin. But after Christ, I feel sorry not because of the consequence, because of what I've done to the Creator, the Savior. Against God and only God have I sinned and done what is wrong in His sight. A life lived to God is a life set free from, set, from sin. Verse 7. For who, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. You see, in Christianity, there is no such thing as a betweener. The Puritans used this phrase. They didn't say a betweener. They said a person between Good Friday and Easter. There is no such thing as a person between Good Friday and Easter. A person who says they believe in the death and they ask for forgiveness, but they don't experience the resurrected life. A life lived to God is a life of life. Now, if we have died with Christ, verse 8, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. John Owens called this the death of death and the death of Christ. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Paul, here with the word if, continues his logical understanding and application to the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. None of this is possible without the gift of grace. 
Grace is a supernatural, divine initiative that is irresistible at the foot of the cross and on Sunday morning resurrection. The weight of grace, this is the good news, that for by grace you and I are saved through faith. It's not of our works, and only to say, look what I did. We only are able to see, say, look what he did. Lewis Perry Schaefer is the founder and first president of Dallas Theological Seminary. He spent the last 81 years of his life teaching systematic theology. I'm sorry. He spent... The, oh, yeah, the last 81 years of his life teaching systematic theology, the last few years of his life, 81 years, in a wheelchair. His favorite topic, which he wrote extensively about, was the topic of grace. A few weeks back, I read of one student under Schaefer who said that after a, a moving lecture on grace, the professor closed his Bible, rolled over to the door, and turned off the lights. Not one student moved. And in the darkness, he said, I have spent all my life studying the grace of God, and I am just now beginning to understand it slightly. <laughs> and the little bit that I understand is magnificent. Do you want that, Grace? I do. What you're saying is I, I want what only the grace of God can bring, authentic joy intimacy in a relationship with God that we were created for, but that sin has destroyed. We want freedom from the compulsion of sin. Only grace can do that. In verse 11, Paul closes off this section with a statement to help us begin to calculate grace. He starts with, should we continue in sin so that we get more grace? No, may it never be. So you also must consider. In the Greek, this means calculate and reckon. You must calculate, reckon, understand yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, grace, the gospel, the death that takes away our sins, the resurrection that gives us new life, away from the power of sin, transforms us. And when the gospel transforms us, it transforms and speaks to those around us for generation to generation to generation. In the mid-40s, Don, Warren, Jane, and Emily attended Inglewood High School in Denver, Colorado. Don was adopted into a non-Christian family. He didn't know his parents, never met his parents. Jane was raised an aunt and uncle and and was a part of her family a little bit. Emily lived with her family. Her family served, not her dad, but her mom and sisters at the Salvation Army, and they sang. Warren, Warren was a hoodlum. He was the James Dean of Inglewood High School. He was no good. Jane and Emily both were chasing Warren. Everybody was chasing the James Dean. He had the Vanilla Ice haircut before Vanilla Ice had the haircut. Don came to Christ at a young age, and he was the Jesus freak in Inglewood High School. Everybody knew he was going to be a missionary. Jane and Emily both chased Warren. Emily won. Warren went into the Navy, continued debauchery, 
He continued to do things in his life that eventually cost him his life at age 55, 1985. Jane decided that she would marry the missionary guy, and they spent 60 years on the mission field. Don and Warren didn't really get along. Jane and Emily didn't get along because Jane got Don and Emily got Warren. They had kids. Emily and Warren had James. Don and Jane had Claudine, and they lived in two different states. So going to high school together, went to different places. Don came, or uh, Warren came to Christ after the Navy and decided to be a pastor. Emily said, if you become a pastor, I don't want to be a pastor's wife, I will divorce you. He went to seminary and became a pastor in the Midwest, and Emily didn't divorce him. And then, 19 years later, their kids, Claudine and James, met and got married. Go figure. That's my grandparents and my parents. Warren became a pastor for 30 years. I have several of his sermons. He proclaimed the gospel. And in his sermons, he talked about his debauchery and his sin and how his life was transformed. I remember talking to my grandma Emily one last time before she passed in the early 2000s about her faith. Don and Jane just passed this past year after over 60 years of marriage, 60 years of ministry together. You see, I share that with you because a life transformed by the gospel transforms the people around you. At, at some point, the proof is in your life. The evidence of the resurrection is there. Paul says we are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's what we celebrate today on Resurrection Sunday. I want to invite you to stand as we praise God and celebrate His grace together this morning.